Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this uh, Bitnami and AWS uh, webinar. Um, today, we are going to cover how to continuously refresh your IT service self-service catalogs. Um, as we go through the webinar, we encourage you to post your questions in the chat and we will answer them in the live Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Um, so keep those questions coming in. Um, today, our speakers are Matt, who is a Senior Business Development Manager at Bitnami, now part of VMware, and Sanjay, who is a Senior Technical Business Development Manager at AWS. And Matt, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Miranda. Uh, I'd like to echo and say thank you for taking some time with us today. Um, we'll jump right into it, uh, you know, starting with some introductions here. Uh, my name's Matthew Small. Uh, I handle strategy and architecture here for our customers and our cloud provider partners uh, at Bitnami inside of VMware. Uh, I joined uh, as part of the acquisition uh, to the VMware team uh, coming over with Bitnami. And prior to that, uh, I spent 10 years at RightScale, a cloud management platform uh, now owned by Flexera. Uh, so there's uh, my history is primarily related to infrastructure, configuration management, uh, and cloud computing. I'm going to pass it over to Sanjay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you again for taking the time. Uh, my name is Sanjay Garche, and I'm a Senior Technical uh, Business Development Manager with AWS. I, I specifically look after our global and strategic customers across the globe. And uh, my focus has been software engineering, cloud. Um, I've been enter doing uh, enterprise architecture um, and played different roles. So really want to take all those best practices and share that knowledge with you. Uh, I spent now three and a half years at AWS, so looking forward to sharing some of those learnings with all of you today. Thanks, Sanjay. Just to introduce uh, those of you that are new to Bitnami, uh, our little mission here at Bitnami is to make awesome software available to everyone everywhere. Uh, that's certainly no small feat, but we've been doing it now for over a decade. Uh, and if you go to any of the cloud providers, certainly AWS included, uh, and you search for a popular open source technology, chances are the first or second result you'll see says certified by Bitnami. Uh, and what that means is that that application is up to date with the latest open source release. It is free of known vulnerabilities and exploits, and that is functionally tested and ready for you to run on your cloud platform or target of choice. Uh, we build for everything from local machines all the way up uh, through to the cloud, through to containers. Uh, so chances are you can find a Bitnami app in the format that you need as well. Our results speak for themselves over 100 out of our 180 applications uh, and the thousand releases a month that we do or more. Uh, our applications are deployed over a million times per month uh, and run over a billion and a half operational hours in the cloud alone. Uh, so these are apps that are used everywhere uh, and it's awesome software from uh, projects and vendors that you're looking to engage with. So everything for your developers requiring uh, a Node.js foundation or a turnkey component for Redis or MongoDB, uh, up through your marketing team needing a full stack application uh, for Word with WordPress or Drupal, pre-configured, ready to deploy and scale. Specifically today, we're going to be talking about how can you turn around and offer a catalog of applications and in cloud services uh, and promote the successful and compliant use of those in your organization. Um, and so this is really what we mean by providing a self-service IT experience. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about how to maintain those IT self-service catalogs to ensure that you're always offering the freshest and best content for your consumers. And then we'll show you some demonstrations of this in action uh, with the AWS Service Catalog, as well as ServiceNow. We'll also show you the VMware Cloud Marketplace and some uh, ways to deploy these applications in your Kubernetes clusters. The content here today is about 100 level technical um, you know, really relevant for anybody that's uh, a central IT or an engineering leader that's really looking uh, to turn this around and offer a curated selection of pre-approved applications and components. To set the tone here, we do live in a collaborative software-defined world. 
And opinions and software and components and code and architectures and all of the things that comprise our applications are compiled not just from multiple sources, but from multiple people and multiple opinions about how those things should be done. But really what we've learned over that time is that we really need to consider a lot of different sources and content in order to be successful. And organizations have been forced to balance what development typically wants, often slanted towards choice, convenience, flexibility, and ease of use, with what operations requires to successfully operate an application long term and successfully serve the outcome of the business, which is visibility into how those applications are performing, compliance with organizational policy or industry best practices and standards, ensuring that these things are done in a secure and controlled way and that they are reliable once deployed. And this balance between speed and security is typically what we call cloud governance. Uh, the idea that we can have both, but it does take some balance to get right. Now, developers have had it really good for quite some time now with cloud. You can very easily go and get a lot of choice, a lot of convenience, a lot of flexibility and ease of use directly from AWS and other cloud providers. Operations, on the other hand, is trying to allow developers to work at that speed without causing friction in the process. And so they've been tasked with now delivering a self-service experience that is not just matching what a developer can otherwise find from a marketplace or from Docker Hub or community sources, but making that a superior self-service experience. In that, there's no questions that the applications, components of those applications that are required are seamlessly enforcing the organization's best practices for compliance, security, and ongoing operations. And so one of the things that we can do to facilitate this is actually taking a page from the vending machine business and providing a point of consumption that is completely on demand and provides that curated selection that's required. So this is just, these are four top benefits from express vending on vending machines in general. And let's explore how this actually impacts IT and delivery of compliant applications. So the first one was staff satisfaction. A vending machine is a convenient and accessible source of food. It's somewhere that they can go, they can find what they might want, they can procure it, and they can have a conversation about something in the process. We talk a lot about the water cooler effect. The vending machine has a very similar effect. People tend to collaborate around vending machines. Vending machines offer low overhead. Uh, there's no staff requirements. There's not a kiosk that anybody has to go to. They're open 24 by 7, 365. Uh, and there's no wait. If I have the money, if they have the product, I can complete my transaction. In some cases, not all, they can offer healthy options. Healthy options, you know, might be in the, in the food world. Hey, you're going to offer something that's actually good for your employees out of your vending machine. That's especially important when we're talking about IT vending machines to promote a healthy operating environment. We'll go back into that in a moment. And of course, keeping staff on site. You know, it's, it's great to let, you know, people go out to lunch, uh, but it may be less great uh, on the overall productivity. And so a vending machine vendor is going to say, well, hey, if you offer that food on site, people will just get that food on site and it's not going to be uh, you know, a drag on your organization. In our world, that's about keeping things compliant in your virtual data center walls. But we really have to focus on keeping these things fresh. Uh, this includes modern interfaces. You can't have the old interface with relatively low capacity, a bad selection, an antiquated billing interface, uh, and just a poor user experience. This is 
something that you have to supply that is superior. If your self-service experience is a pain to deal with, people are going to do what they can to continue to avoid it. You also have to make sure that the content is fresh. Nobody wants the five-year-old goodie bun from the vending machine in your office. They also don't want the five-year-old application replete with all its vulnerabilities from their IT self-service vending machine. And so you have to make sure that your pipelines are also fresh and not gunked up and that they're continuously delivering that fresh content in the freshest, least vulnerable way that's going to provide you the best security posture overall. So short answer, don't let your stuff get moldy. So a well-operated IT vending machine is hygienic. That, staff, that staff, staff satisfaction comes from finding exactly what you need and the experience is good. It just works out of the box. There's nothing else that needs to be done in order to get to that useful moment with the software. There's low overheads. Automation can keep the pipeline stocked fresh, updated and vulnerability free without human intervention. Once you've determined to put a product in your catalog, ensure that automation is going to keep it fresh. Those healthy options are your best fit architectures for your cloud operating environments. For example, maybe your best fit reference architecture in AWS uses Aurora DB as the backend for your WordPress uh, blog. But when you deploy it in containers or deploy it on-prem, you're going to run that MySQL database on containers or VMs, respectively. So having and being able to promote healthy operating options in context of the environment that they need to operate in will give you a healthy, well-operated outcome. This also means ensuring that your telemetry, things like your logging and centralized monitoring systems, are also pre-wired up. Ensure that out of the box, when the developer or the end user consumes that application, that the end result is pre-instrumented pre -instrumented to work with all of your existing tooling and process. Whether that's sending logs to Splunk, uh, updating a record uh, in a change management database, whatever you do today in order to keep track of these resources, ensure that your vending machine is healthily operating within those processes. And finally, keeping staff on site. Build all of this stuff to spec so that to your own specifications in the formats that people are requesting and put them where they need to be consumed. Have a vending machine for AWS and AWS. Have a vending machine for Kubernetes that offers point click or self-service deployment offerings in a Kubernetes cluster. Deliver all of this content to the point of consumption and ensure it's ready to be consumed. And in that way, you're now offering a superior experience. There's no question for your consumer as to whether or not the thing that they just launched from your self-service experience meets their compliance objectives. There's no question that it's wired up to your telemetry systems. And there's no question that wherever it's provisioned, it's using the most optimization for that platform. Another area that you should be focused on is the pipeline and ensuring that it's automation that is collecting all of these opinions about how software should be built. The automation is often conflated with just somebody being required to collect all of the opinions about how to make something work. A good successful DevOps practice is not about putting individuals in the middle of a release. It's about driving consensus between different teams and different individuals with different levels of expertise and creating artifacts that represent that known good collaboration. So when we talk about shifting left here at Bitnami, 
it's not about giving people more responsibilities for things that they may not be experts in. For example, it's not about making the developer a security expert. It's about driving collaboration between the best practices and security that the developer understands. These are the best uh, you know, packages for my application and the components that security understands. And this is how it fits into our CIS hardening guidelines or whatever it is, uh, other compliance frameworks or certification frameworks they may care about. So we talk about shifting left to code or to codified process to create that handshake between all of the individuals required to truly create a known good release. We also need to ensure that that known good release is distributed directly to the consumer where they need to consume it. Today, we're gonna to highlight some of the visual experiences with a self-service catalog, although we're gonna also show you how you can do some of this stuff directly from a command line as well. So the end consumer could be a person, an individual that's going to discover and deploy uh, this artifact, or it could be a pipeline that is going to discover or consume or layer additional things on top of the components that are moving through your pipeline. But in every case, ensure that that known good collaboration, that artifact and all of its component pieces, whatever they are, gets secured all the way down to its point of consumption, whether a local machine, a visual UI service catalog, or an automated pipeline. And with that, I'd like to switch this over to Sanjay here to talk about this in the context of AWS uh, and how AWS is improving this experience uh, for their users. Awesome. Thank you, Matt, for that great uh, summary so far. So when I'm in the field and talking to all the customers, one of the big pain points they share with me is, hey, look, you know, we have all these developers and the reason we are moving into the cloud is we want to give them the agility, the speed, so we can build you know, the, the most disruptive business models and, and really kind of innovate, experiment, fail fast. And if you really want to live that dream, you want to give your developers the self-service. And the natural way to do that in AWS would be, you know, we have the console, we have APIs, we have CLIs, we expose the console to them, that's your self-service, why are we even here, right? Why, well, what's the big deal? So if you look at the current state of self-service, what happens is um, we have 170 plus services and counting, right? And those who have already are familiar with AWS, uh, if you have looked at even a simple product like EC2, when you go and try to launch a virtual machine, you can imagine there are so many twists and turns and knobs you can turn so as a developer, you now need to know, okay, what's the instance type you're supposed to be provisioning, right? And we have, I don't know, 1,400 plus instance types starting from T2 micro to some of the really most expensive GPU instances and things like that. Uh, that's just the picking the right instance type and that impacts your cost. Then if you start, continue on that, on that chart, you probably then have to say, figure out what's the security group you need to configure, uh, meaning what ports you need to keep open what ports need to keep closed. So you're now relying on developers to figure out all those right choices. And on top of that, what EBS volume you need to attach, do you need to have encryption turned on or, or off on that? What's the replication? What's the disaster recovery for that VM? And that's just one service. Uh, and so that's what we are seeing on the screen here. Um, the other service, the favorite service that I like to pick on is S3, right? So literally the name of the service is S3 simple storage service, you use it for, you know, storing files or blobs or um, block, uh, different blob objects. Now, if you already know HTTP get, put, list, delete, you are pretty much familiar with S3. Those are the current operations you can do on S3, and a developer can simply come in there, create a bucket, and start using S3 on day one. Life is simple. You are using cloud often, right? But as your operational maturity grows, right? And as, as, as I've seen customers go from like day one in the cloud to let's say the second year, the first year in the cloud, at the end of that journey, they realize, 
oh, I have all this content, and then I'm storing that in S3 standard storage tier. But if I were to just move that content into, let's say, S3 infrequently accessed, or you know, one zone I or Glacier, depending on the use case, you might save almost 90% on your S3 cost, right? And your CFO will be really happy for that. Uh, that's just one aspect of configuring S3. That comes to so that's the financial aspect, right? When it comes to security, you you now have options available to you. You can turn on encryption. Um, encryption is common sense. But then when it comes to S3, we give you server-side encryption or client-side encryption. Which one is the right one for your use case? Now you're relying on your developer to make that choice. So so on and so forth, there's versioning, there's lifecycle policies. So you get the point. Um, you can try and give all this self-service to your developers, but then we have 180, 180 services and counting. And internally, I would say, like for us, it's difficult to keep up with everything because I look I look at all our uh, services as their own independent startups, and we're we're kind of I struggle internally to keep up with everything. So when you hire these developers, the data scientists, whose primary responsibility is to let's say do web application development, or mobile app development, or data science, machine learning, that's their primary core skill set. On top of that, they have to learn your company's culture, they have to you know, get along with your teams, and then when they're, when they're doing stuff in cloud, they also need to know all these things. So you cannot, I would argue that you cannot really make everybody, let's say S3 Ninja, maybe you can, maybe you make them S3 Ninja, EC2 Ninja, but what about all the other 169 services, or, you know, and then always growing. So the point is, what if, wouldn't it be nice if you can using infrastructure as a code, pre-configure all the building blocks that you want to give them beforehand, right? So if we move on to the next slide, so the idea would be you as the, the, the fact that you have taken the time to be on this call, right, you, you know that doing things right is important and it takes time and energy to figure that out. So for AWS, when you want to configure the right building blocks or the right pieces or the right services that you want to provide to your developers or your rest of the organization, you can start with using infrastructure as a code paradigm, right, and not have to worry about um, kind of manually building anything. Just come together as security team, infrastructure team, networking team. All of those core constituents team can work together to pre-provision the reference architectures, right? So back in the day when I was doing enterprise architecture, we'll create these wiki documents or word documents, and that was our you know, boxes on the paper or boxes on the board, whiteboard, and we'll say this is how we should structure things. And then we'll do like brown bag sessions and you know, hoping that everybody else that's attending those sessions will follow our, our vision and what we're trying to do for the company to move everybody along the same lines. But you know the results of that, right? When it came to execution, Everybody did things their own way, and there wasn't really a good executable way to enforce that. Well, with the cloud, now that you're in cloud, AWS cloud definitely gives you this way where instead of just you know, doing those things using theory and wikis and Word documents, you can now actually, using infrastructure as a code, provision all those services as a cookie cutter, self-service, one-click deploy options, right? And so the diagram here is you have choices. You can use either uh, Terraform. You can use AWS CloudFormation. Uh, AWS Service Catalog supports both of those technologies. And you can configure all of those best practices using the, the things that you know works for your company, right? But there may be one way to provision EC2, but that may not be the best way for your company, for your use case. Maybe you're in a financial industry or maybe you're in a pharmaceutical industry and you have maybe PCI or HIPAA regulation and things need to be done differently. Well, you can't make every developer in your company a HIPAA hero, right? But what you could do is say, hey, here's a, we have done all the heavy lifting and we have configured the right infrastructure using infrastructure as a code and we are giving that to you as a self-service service catalog product. What, what's a self-service service catalog product? Anything and everything that you can configure using infrastructure as a code in AWS, that pretty much means all the rest of the AWS services. So it could be EC2, S3, EMR, SageMaker, 
but it can be uh, as complicated as you know your three tier architecture stack right so one of the demo we're going to do today is actually a, a three tier wordpress website that has you know compute database and everything all the other layers so all the building blocks can be put together as a functioning application and that itself can be provided as a self service product in service catalog the other thing that we would like to call out here is so one of the pain points customers share with me is tagging, right? So, and I equate tagging to kind of what Matt was saying earlier, eating healthy food. Uh, we all know eating healthy food is the right thing to do. It's easy to understand. But for me, at least, it's really difficult to implement, right? Every time it's given choice, it's easy to choose pizza or slice of pizza over um, salad. So when it comes to tagging, I would equate to the same way. When you're launching things in AWS Cloud, if you were to do a virtual poll right now, um, you can just you know, answer that to yourself, how many of you tag your resources? And, and by virtue of you being on this call, you're supposedly the expert at your company, right? And if you're not tagging your stuff, uh, how do you expect other people in the company to tag their resources? So Service Catalog, AWS Service Catalog solves that problem because as the administrator, you can pre-provision, right, saying, hey, here's a bunch of tags. So for example, application, infrastructure layer, is it dev stage prod, cost center, which BU does this resource belongs to, right? And you can pre-configure those uh, tag options library, what we call it, and associate those with those self-service products. So to that vending machine diagram, anybody who is trying to get or vend things out of the vending machine, unless and until they answer those questions correctly and they, they must answer those, users are not allowed to vend things out. So that becomes your centralized kind of gatekeeping as well, because now you can essentially enforce tagging across the enterprise if they're coming through that vending machine gate. And the other advantage there for you is you know, things change, right? So maybe you're giving an EC2 as a service, and the current army that you're using, maybe the operating system, you know, has some holes, and you come, uh, that happens all the time, and you patch it with the next version. And you want to make that next version available as a self-service. So a lot of times customers share that becomes a big problem. Uh, different developers, they're using different ARMY versions. And just maintaining those uh, you know, ARMYs across the company becomes a big nightmare. So if, if you were to use something like AWS Service Catalog here, since everybody's coming to that vending machine, you can simply update the version of the EC2 product to, let's say, from version 1.0 to 2.0 which leverages the latest army and that way and you can also disable the previous version that way anybody now moving forward wants to come and provision ec2 as a product they will always be on the latest and greatest those who have already provisioned stuff they will still be on the older one but as soon as they terminate the older version and they try to provision something new uh, by virtue of that they'll all be you're moving towards the standardization your security posture is getting better and better as, as people operate using AWS Service Catalog. So those are some of the basic benefits of you know, how you can provision things, how you can configure things, and really make it easy, uh, make it one-click deploy self-service vending machine for your you know, IT as well as your data scientists as well as your other business users who want to interact with AWS services. So with that, we're going to move to the next slide. Right, so now that we do this, how does this now look for the, you know, in the new world? So the, the ideal is, you know, how we have well-architected framework, right, and we have all these different pillars, uh, security, operations, finance, things like that. So what I would recommend is what some of our customers who do this really well, they'll take the time initially to figure out, okay, they'll get the, the core teams together, which would include security team, infrastructure team, the networking team, even the finance team, right, from budgeting perspective, the application owners, the application architects, and they'll all work together to figure out how should be, you know, what are the most common reference architectures that we need to make it available to the rest of our company, right? And GoDaddy is a great example of this. They actually did a uh, reInvent talk, last reInvent, reInvent 2018, uh, in Vegas with us. Uh, it's available on YouTube. I would highly recommend you watch that. So the use case there was, as you're moving into the cloud, 
you also want to accelerate your migration uh, because that's when your the speed to market the value from cloud will be uh, realized. And a lot of times, what happens, different teams that are working independently across the company. Uh, if you really take a hard look at all those teams and what they're trying to provision, uh, it's very easy. And this is what GoDaddy also had realization on. So by and large, the web application teams are probably using similar architectures. And, and the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the time, people are spinning up 20% of the, the types. So you can easily catalog those, take the time, work together, and figure out what that 80% of the stuff is for your company and put that in AWS Service Catalog as a self-service product, right? So GoDaddy did this, and their use case was to migrate into AWS, and how do, how do they do it quickly so that in the same amount of time, they can get 5x the teams onboarded onto AWS Cloud, right? And using AWS Service Catalog, they were able to figure that out, put 80% of the common referenceable architecture products, EC2, S3, EMR, SageMaker, uh, into the AWS Service Catalog, give that access to the rest of the company, let the teams you know, self-onboard and start leveraging cloud for the innovation that, that you're trying to do in the first place. So that's one use case. The second use case I would, uh, I would like to highlight here is, is from one of our customers. Um, the, what used to happen, IT team became the kind of the ticket addressing machine, right? And everybody in the company is coming to IT and saying, hey, I need something in the cloud. And 70% of that team's time was spent on addressing these tickets, right? So somebody will say, say I want an S3 bucket. Somebody will say, I need a DynamoDB table. And once you provision that, they'll come back the next day and say, hey, I need to change the RCUs and WCUs on my DynamoDB table, the capacity to something else, because I didn't provision the, uh, I didn't give you the right requirements in the first place. Well, all that was taking 70% of that team's time. So we worked with that team, and we figured out all those common requests, put that in your IT self-service, you know, service catalog as a self-service, you know, option, and let the developers just come to that and self-serve. That added significant productivity to that team, and that's how they were able to use AWS service catalog, right? And the big thing here is, even though we are looking at, at console, once we do the demo, you'll see that everything that you provision or you make it available as a self-service menu can be provisioned using either CLI, API, or console, right? So depending on your users and your development team's culture, if they want to use Jenkins to do automated builds and then as part of immutable infrastructure, build that infrastructure as part of every build, uh, pets versus cattle, cattle versus pets, you know, all that can be done here, uh, DevOps style. You just, you know, every release you create a brand new infrastructure and you're just calling AWS Service Catalog to snap out that new infrastructure layer. And the benefit of that is now you, by virtue of using everything from Service Catalog, you're closer to, you know, your standardization goals, you're closer to your security goals because you now have, you know, a better compliance posture. Because everybody is using Service Catalog and you have tagging enforced, you can tag, and there's a new feature AWS Service Catalog released just yesterday, which is you can also now connect your tags with budgets. So essentially you can say for EC2 for this month for this theme, I only want to have $5,000 as a monthly budget. And by virtue of everybody spinning things up from Service Catalog, you can naturally now track that. And if the team were to grow into this gray zone, meaning let's say they are closer to 90% of the cost, then you can send them an email, send them a notification, send a notification to their manager saying, hey, look, you're going to be you know, going beyond your allocated cost or allocated budget and take some action on it. And if they go in the red zone, what I would call cost that budget, then you can potentially take away their service catalog access so they can't uh, provision any more new EC2 instances, things like that. So sky is the limit, depending on your company's culture, depending on your skill set. You can do a lot of automation there because we have APIs, we have notifications, um, we have Lambda functions, so you can do a ton of things there. But the idea is the new state of self-service gets you closer to the promise of the cloud, which is to do things quicker. Um, and if we go to the next slide now, right, in order to do things quicker, you don't want to give up your security. You don't want to give up your compliance because those are real 
things. And if you don't have those, uh, that will that does expose your company to different risks, which management doesn't like and we don't like. So in the interest of the shared security model, I would call it this as an extension of that shared security model where you take on the, the additional um, bias for action, right, responsibility, and you're going to take uh, the commonly requested infrastructure items. Um, and just don't think or limit itself to infrastructure. It can also be the application components that you're using from AWS, right? So all that is commonly requested can go into your service catalog as a vending machine. So the security team, the finance team, the executive team is happy, but at the same time, developers, the data scientists, the business users, they still get their agility, the time to market, and self-service. So hopefully that gives you the value of using AWS Service Catalog. With this, we're going to jump into a demo. So I will start uh, sharing my screen here. Hopefully folks can see my screen. All right. So right now, what I have done is I have logged in here into my browser. And I've logged in here, if you notice I'm highlighting, I've logged in as an engineer user. So I'm an engineer with limited access. And here's my service catalog. This is how, if you were to log into AWS service catalog, it's a four plus year old service now. Um, you can, everybody has access to this. It's region based. So you can have different service catalog portfolio in different regions. So portfolio is just a collection of products. So right now I have two products available to me, which are configured and pre, uh, pre configured by my administrative teams for me to consume. So one of the product is WordPress certified by Bitnami. So this is a AWS Marketplace product that I provision, uh, that I subscribe to, and I can copy that into my own AWS service catalog, right? And if I were to launch this, let's say I'm going to launch that. Launching that through console is not primarily what people do. Um, most of our users would be launching this through console, uh, API and CLI. Uh, but just for the demo purposes, I just want to walk you guys through the clicks of it here, and, but we'll actually provision this using CLI. So as part of this product, I'm asked to uh, provide a key name. So what's the key name that I want to associate that with that EC2 instance for SSH? What's the VPC? What's the submit ID? So I'm just going to pick some uh, random values here. So the other thing that I want to call out here is, so in this instance type, um, I've given a little bit larger op uh, choices of options, but you can, you can completely control this and say, you know, for this team, I only want to give them T2 micro and that's it, right? You can even, you even have the option where if you already know that it's for the development teams and you want to standardize on T2 micro, you don't even have to expose this option to them. So these, all these parameters is something that you control through your service catalog product provisioning infrastructure as a code cloud formation template. So let's say I'm going to select the security group and in architecture. Uh, so again, a lot of our customers were, especially for data scientists, they don't even want to pick all these options because this again exposes a lot of details. Uh, this is just a demo, but you could actually create a product where maybe there are zero parameters and all the parameters are picked up behind the scene uh, based on you know, what that product is. So that is a viable option, and a lot of our customers do do that based on the complexity that they want to expose to their end users. So here's the, the big thing that I was trying to mention, uh, eating healthy food. We don't make the right choices. Same thing for tagging. If you were to skip tagging, service catalog won't allow you to do that. And as the administrator, you get to pick and choose what tags and what options do you want to enforce, right? So in my case, um, my administrator has already provisioned, let's say, BU and cost center, those two tags. So I must select one of that. So let's say I'm an engineer, so I belong to engineering BU, and my cost center is, let's say, for this case, it's dev. And I can also add new value if I want to, but let's say I'm just going to stick with that. It also has notifications, so you could um, hook this up with an SNS topic, and when things are provisioned, you can get a notification. And if you were to hit next, it will simply, uh, and if I were to launch right now, 
it will launch a WordPress website you know, by default uh, as part of this provisioning. But as we promised to you, most of our developers would, would not use clicks, right? Because as an administrator, we like automation. And in order for automation, we need to use CLI. So let's try to do the same thing using CLI, right? So what I've done here is um, th this is running on my local. I have a Jupyter notebook. I just use this to kind of keep all my commands together. But you can simply execute this on your um, AWS CLI uh, on your terminal window. Same thing. So I'm going to jump to this step, right? So in order for you to provision anything in AWS Service Catalog, it can be as simple as an API or a CLI command like this. You're saying AWS Service Catalog provision product API, and you're, you have to mention a few things, right? And indeed, these things would include what product version you want to provision, and what are the values for the different tags, uh, things like that. So for example, all those VPC, the key name, all that information you need to provide. So all those gates still need to be um, approved, and you need to make sure you're providing the right values for those. So all that is here. So let's say if I were to just run this command right now, here it is. So it gives me a record ID back. So if I were to, I can pull this record ID to see what's going on with my uh, current status of that. So here it is. It's showing its status is in progress. And here's all the values that we had passed. And it is trying to now provision a WordPress blog for us. Right? If I were to go back to my provision product list, here it is. It shows up as something that we just kicked off. It's under change. And if we were to wait for like a few seconds, it will come back. And we should be able to um, pull that, continue pull that through our API command here, right? So CLI. So let's say the if I continue poll, it's still in progress. So let's give it a minute. While it's doing its thing, I also want to call that out to you that a lot of companies nowadays are also leaning towards ITSM tools, so things like ServiceNow. And if you happen to be a company or organization that's using ServiceNow for letting developers request things, whatever service catalog we just saw, we do have AWS Service Catalog team. Uh, we do have a ServiceNow connector that you can download for free from ServiceNow store. And I've done that here. And so here's the ServiceNow developer instance. I've logged in there as a developer. So here I also get to see what are the self-service products that are available to me. The same WordPress service, uh, WordPress as a service, right, is also available to me as a product. The same input parameters that I have to provide in the console, the same, they, they are all the same here. They all, the connector is just pulling all that information using APIs from AWS Service Catalog. And same thing for tagging. So I could, a lot of companies, what they do, they'll have the developers create a ticket in ServiceNow, which then ends up with some IT cloud administrator's desk, and then they have to go into AWS account and do something. You can eliminate all that overhead by essentially having the self-service commonly requested products in your AWS service catalog. And if ITSM uh, ServiceNow is your tool of choice, you could use AWS service catalog connector and essentially make that end-to-end -end process you know, seamless. And the developers can essentially self-serve, and they don't have to come and create a ticket somewhere. And everything is still tracked in ServiceNow, uh, ServiceNow CMDB database. So if you're doing asset management tracking, all that stuff is available to you in ServiceNow. So let's go back and check on our um, what's going on with our request for provisioning a WordPress blog here. So if we were to describe that, it looks like it succeeded. Here's the status. Right. So if I were to go back to our window here, it's also available. So if you look at it, as part of this record, it's also going to give me uh, what are the different tags that were attached to the EC2 instance or that WordPress server. And everything that we passed, the BU cost center was attached. But there are also these additional auto tags that we call it that are free to you. So service catalog adds this additional um, tagging as well. So that way you can keep track of who the user was. So in this case, 
here was a user that actually created this resource, right? So you have more metadata available to you for audit and other operational purposes. But as part of the output, here's the key thing, right? So you get a DNS name back, and you control what output you want to give back as the administrator. So let's say if I were to copy paste that, and if the demo guards are with us, voila, there's our WordPress blog. And me as a developer to launch this, this could be a marketing person who wants to get a new you know, dev WordPress block created or a developer who's trying to test things out. I never had to talk to anybody. My IT team has done the work to just provision that. I give, give that to me as a self-service product. All I did is one API call, one CLI command, and I got my WordPress block up and running in AWS. Right? So that's the advantage of using something like vending machine. Uh, but again, to Matt's point, you want to make sure it's maintained, and as the IT administrator, that's what you're going to be focusing on. So you get the security, you get the compliance, but the developers get the self-service. So with that, um, Matt, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you, Sanjay. Great demo, uh, and thank you for explaining to us, too, how Service Catalog methodologies really apply to that developer experience. Uh, as you saw, you can really start consuming these principles through automation, not just the visual interfaces. Uh, that being said, I'm going to show you a couple more visual interfaces and permutations on the theme and how you might represent this in other places. Uh, the first thing that I'll uh, introduce you to is the new VMware Cloud Marketplace, uh, where uh, you can go and find our content in the AWS Cloud Marketplace directly. You can also now find the Bitnami Community Catalog content uh, here and available for free on other formats, such as VMC on AWS, directly in the VMware Cloud Marketplace. Discovering this content, whether you're a developer looking for a component piece, a turnkey tool like uh, Jenkins, uh, or a full stack application like a WordPress, you can come in here, you can subscribe, very similar to the AWS Marketplace experience, uh, and you can input your software-defined data center credentials and details in order to provision this into your account. I'll also uh, actually share that uh, the PKS, Pivotal Kubernetes Service uh, approved versions are also found here. All of this content is tested and pre-validated uh, against the target uh, that we are publishing it for. So you can know that out of the box, you've got uh, a validated experience that you can turn around and offer for your end users. One way you might choose to do that, or one format you know, that you might choose to do that on is Kubernetes. Uh, and for that, uh, we also have something called the VMware Cloud Marketplace Client which connects that marketplace public discovery to the cluster in which you want to actually discover and deploy that content in. Uh, so for example, if I'm a data scientist, I just need Airflow, I'm supposed to use Kubernetes, but that doesn't mean that I should be a Kubernetes expert. Sanjay gave a great example just with simple storage service. Expecting everybody to become a Kubernetes expert is an even taller order. But you do probably have maybe an Airflow expert on staff that needs to do an ETL project and they need all of the bits and bytes required to do that delivered as a service. You know, so here is a simple discovery and deployment experience that allows them to do that within a Kubernetes cluster. Um, this, as I'm showing you, is uh, an early preview of what we're working on inside of VMware. Um, you can also grab the open source flavor of this here uh, at QBAPS, <clears throat> excuse me, QBAPS.io, and you can run this in any Kubernetes cluster of your choice. This one happens to be in EKS. Uh, but really creating and connecting that discovery to deployment experience in a catalog. Furthermore, catalogs promote that well-operated or hygienic environment by helping users self-manage the upgrade process. Uh, so here, for example, you see that I've got a Magento deployed and my Magento uh, is now out of date. So uh, I've got, uh, I deployed version 8.3.1, version 8.3.2 is available. How did it become available? 
Bitnami's secure software supply chain, put that into my repository for me, and now I have a notification that I could update this application. Clicking the upgrade button here will bump me to that new version uh, and starting, I want to grab this one here, and allow me uh, to define some input variables. Sanjay showed parameters and inputs for a cloud formation. Uh, these are parameters and inputs uh, for a Helm chart. But as you can see, we're just wrapping that experience in a deployment template uh, in order to make that self-service experience clean and consistent and most importantly, compliant with how this application needs to be deployed in that organization. So just another couple permutations on the theme to get you thinking about other formats. Uh, as a next step here, uh, we would love to invite you uh, to check out the Bitnami community catalog in the AWS marketplace. Uh, go and search there for Bitnami or sort by Bitnami as the publisher. There's over 200 different offerings there in AMI format and CloudFormation template format. Um, you know, you'll see quite a bit. Uh, the VMware Cloud Marketplace uh, is another area you can go if you're using VMC on AWS uh, or any VMware native uh, capabilities, vCenter, for example. Uh, and uh, I'd also invite you to get in touch uh, if you're interested in Bitnami curating and providing this capability in these applications to you directly as a service. So separate from our generic and publicly available free catalog from Bitnami Community Catalog, uh, we would invite you to get in touch with us if you see this problem at scale in your organization and you're trying to figure out how to drive good artifacts that represent good compliant collaborations of your teams into your pipelines. Uh, we'd love to engage with you, give you a sense of what we have planned uh, with Project Galleon and invite you to our early access program. My contact information in Sanjay's is there. Please also feel free to get, us, get in touch with our teams at this alias uh, and we can assist you. Uh, with that and the remaining time that we have left, uh, I'm going to pass it, the torch back to Miranda here uh, and we can take some Q&A. Thanks, Matt. Um, thank you, Matt and Sanjay, for a great presentation. So as Matt said, we'll move to live Q&A now. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat um, and we will get to them right now. Um, but for the time being, as we're waiting for more to come in, I will answer a few that uh, came in during the presentation. Um, so for Sanjay, um, you mentioned the 80-20 rule. How do you suggest um, I capture requirements for the 20%? Great question. Um, so 80-20, 80% will get you up and running quickly. That should be part of your initial design, you know, initial cloud migration journey, or as part of your operational excellence, how do you, you know, get um, into cloud faster? So that will take care of 80%. But for your 20%, so those are the ad hoc things or one-off things that maybe your developer is trying to do something or your data scientist uh, trying to experiment with something new that you just haven't yet gotten the time to put into your service catalog. So for things like that, you should have a process where maybe if you're using ServiceNow or if you're using internal wiki or what have you, uh, there should be an internal communication channel where that team is reaching out to you. And as a de facto cloud center of excellence or infrastructure you know, platform team, it's your team that's then kind of quickly um, taking into account their needs, figuring out what they want. And then even you know, a lot of other teams um, so either depending on the, the number of people that you have in your team available, you can take uh, that role of centralized team that then goes quickly and tries to make that new template, the new service catalog product available for the, that 20% the of the time. Um, that is one way to do it. It has its, its own pros and cons, right? The obvious pros is you have more control and you can drive standardization quickly. The cons of that is most customers that I work with the centralized platform team, it just cannot scale. And so the other option there is kind of using the open source model, right? Uh, most successful software projects are open source projects, and there's the idea of contributor. People can, you know, there's an open source repo, and, and developers can do a pull request, and they can contribute their code back. Same idea, you can have 
the, the idea of a hub portfolio, which is the centralized portfolio for your company, the service catalog products, and you can give your developers, especially the ones that want to you know, experiment and do things quickly, you can give them the access to also contribute into that centralized hub of service catalog products. That way, you as the IT team, you're not the only uh, provisioning everything and configuring everything. So that team can check those things into some sort of GitHub or some repo, and then your team can quickly be in charge or maybe have some automated checks to make sure everything is passing the test before you put that product as a, you know, a self-service product in the hub that then goes out to all the other AWS accounts for the rest of your team and the rest of your company. So great question. Um, a quick call out on that, as Matt mentioned, those are some of the advanced topics. And if you guys have further questions or would like us to kind of show you how to do that, uh, I do have team, uh, I work with the technical BD team, business development, and I have team members right from London, France, to you know, all over the North America. So if you, no matter where you are, we have an extended team. So if you want to email us out at awsfcbd, uh, hyphen included there, at amazon.com, one of us will be happy to make sure your needs are met, your questions are answered, and we get you the right help um, in, in, on site when needed. Great. Sanjay, All that's right. great. Uh, and, and I'd just like to add, I, I love how this is truly reflecting a lot of the principles that we had talked about. You know, the service catalog being that discovery hub of what's in there today, what's possible for me to do without uh, any extra steps. Uh, but then it also kind of becomes the hub and discovery for what are the gaps in the organization. And now you're having meetings and, you know, driving process around filling those gaps and doing so in a way uh, that meets a broader organizational goal. Uh, and driving that consensus through infrastructure as code and automation, reflecting it with a known good artifact. Uh, I think that really hits the, hits the nail on the head. Thank you. Yes, thank you both. Um, and then Matt, this one is for you, and I believe you kind of touched on that with project, uh, with you know the different projects from VMware. Uh, but how can I customize my applications in my catalog? Yeah, really great question. So um, you can grab any of Bitnami's content again for free from the community catalog. Uh, just like community content, it is generic. It is one size fits all, uh, and it's great, you know, if you need to be able to quickly get in and rapidly prototype something, test a new technology, experiment with something, you know, build an MVP. But as you're moving that application through into production, you probably have other requirements, uh, whether that's, well, we're, you know, using MySQL on a container now, but we're gonna use Aurora DB when we deploy this into AWS natively. Uh, and when we actually deploy it, it also needs to be wired up to our centralized logging and monitoring systems. So one way you can do that, start with our content and modify it in place, launch it, log into the thing, make your customizations and you can maintain them. Uh, another model uh, that we'd love to explore with you is Project Galleon, where the content actually arrives to you pre-configured to your specification and maintained as a service. So it's actually Bitnami taking the onus on ourselves to provide you quality content assured to meet your particular organizational constraints and delivered to your repositories and AWS accounts of choice. So you have a complete end-to-end -end accountability of that process. From there, of course, some of that content might be picked up and consumed in other ways. You know, if you're building on top of our Node.js container, then your CI pipeline is pulling that in and maybe creating a new container with your application layered on top. And so we work with you to really wire this all in to your experiences. And so you can consume things uh, without having the additional overhead of more process, of more tools, uh, of more checks and balances, let us take care of that. 
Great, thank you, Matt. And we uh, came to closing time. So if there's any other questions that uh, come in last minute, we'll follow up with you directly. Um, thank you again to everyone who joined and we will be following up with a recording of this webinar uh, and the emails that you can get in touch to our teams directly uh, shortly, probably tomorrow morning. Um, have a great day and uh, thank you again. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye now.